Mortgage rates have become completely unhinged, and nothing will have more impact on the housing market in 2023, so let's just dive right in. Through the first 10 months of the year, mortgage rates doubled, as we all know, but in the last two months, we've seen the average rate on a 30-year mortgage drop more than a full point, from north of 7.3% to now south of 6.2%, even as Jerome Powell raised the Fed rate a half point on December 14th and signaled more increases to come in 2023. So what gives? Doesn't a higher Fed rate mean higher mortgage rates? How can mortgage rates drop while the Fed rate continues upward? And where are mortgage rates heading in 2023? And what can we look to, if not the Fed rate, for guidance? Well, in this video, I'm answering all of those questions. I'm going to dispel of this myth that uninformed realtors and YouTubers have that mortgage rates and the Fed rate are tied to each other. They're not. I'm going to explain what the Fed rate actually is, like who is actually charged that rate and for what and how it affects everything else. Because the Fed rate does have an impact on mortgage rates, just not directly. And that's exactly where we have to start. This video is a little dense and really gets into the economics behind the housing market. But if you're considering participating in the housing market in 2023 as a buyer, seller, or investor, this is stuff you have to know. So let's do it. I'm John Schwartz, a realtor and real estate investor in Los Angeles, California, and I started this channel to help today's home buyers and sellers make sense of this truly once in a century housing market. If you learned something new, please like and subscribe. This graph shows the Fed rate in green and the average rate on a 30-year mortgage in red since 1990. What does this graph tell us? One thing it definitely says is that historically, mortgage rates have always floated above the Fed rate, but the size of that gap, called the spread, varies widely. Sometimes these two rates move in tandem, but sometimes the correlation is pretty weak. Now take a look at the correlation between these two lines. The average 30-year mortgage rate is again in red, and in blue, we have the 10-year treasury yield. These two rates track very closely, and as you can see, the spread is much more consistent. So to know where mortgage rates are headed, we have to understand not just the Fed rate, but also the 10-year treasury yield, what it actually is and how it moves. So let's do it. A treasury note is an IOU from the US government, and they usually sell in $1,000 increments. A treasury note pays interest, let's say $50 per year, and has a term, let's say 10 years. Whoever holds this note gets $50 per year as interest, and at the end of 10 years, gets their $1,000 back. This hypothetical treasury note that we just created $50 per year on $1,000 of principal, plus redemption of the principal at the end of 10 years, has a 5% yield, meaning a 5% return on your money if you held this note. But here's the thing. What if you could buy this treasury note for $900 instead of $1,000? Then you'd be earning $50 a year on $900, plus after 10 years, you'd make an extra $100 because this is, after all, an IOU for $1,000. In this case, because you bought the note for less than its face value, you'd earn more than 5%. This note purchased at $900 has a yield of 6.29%. And I'm not making that up. There's an Excel formula you can use to get the yields on notes with any purchase price, interest rate, or redemption value. Conversely, if you had to pay $1,100 for this $1,000 note, you'd be earning your $50 per year on $1,100 of principal, and you'd end up $100 short at the end of the 10-year term. You'd still end up ahead, but not as far ahead relative to your higher initial investment of $1,100. In fact, according to the Excel formula, this treasury note purchased for $1,100 carries a yield of 3.87%. Why do I bring up the idea of buying treasury notes for less or more than the face value? Because this is exactly what happens on the secondary market. Treasury notes are bought and sold at different prices, and the prices determine the return, or yield. To take a step back, when the treasury sells brand new notes, this is called the primary market. You can think of it as an IPO, except instead of a company selling shares to raise money, it's the US government selling IOUs with interest to raise money. But then financial institutions, as well as individual investors, are able to buy and sell these treasury notes amongst themselves, just as shares of stock are bought and sold amongst investors. So when we talk about the 10-year treasury yield, this graph, we're talking about the going yield for a 10-year treasury note on the secondary market. And notice I say yield, not price, because treasuries are valued by their yield, if that makes sense. On the secondary market, you'll find notes with different interest payments, different redemption amounts, and different durations left until redemption. So note traders have to run the Excel function on everything to determine what the actual yield is at a given price, then pay the appropriate price. I mean, all this happens on supercomputers and microseconds, but I think you get the general idea. So now we understand what this graph is showing us. The price of a 10-year treasury note on the secondary market 
as indicated by the going yield. So our next question is, what causes the yield on the 10-year treasury to fluctuate? Why was the 10-year treasury trading at a yield under 1% in 2020 and over 4% in 2022? Because whatever makes the 10-year treasury yield go up and down will also be what makes mortgage rates go up and down. And if you think this is when we start talking about the Fed rate, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. But keep watching because we're almost there. The yield on the 10-year treasury note is determined by, drum roll please, simple supply and demand. When there's more demand for 10-year treasuries on the secondary market, the price gets bid up, which means the yield goes down. When demand for the 10-year treasury drops, prices fall and the yield goes up. It's a little confusing, but I hope I've laid enough groundwork that you're still following. So then what determines demand for 10-year treasuries? Here's the thing to know. U.S. Treasuries are the safest investment there is, period, full stop. The U.S. has never defaulted on its debt and has the highest possible credit rating of AA plus with a stable outlook. Financial institutions, as well as countries all over the world, buy U.S. Treasuries because they provide the most reliable return. In fact, some investors, like my brother who's at a big hedge fund in Manhattan, cause the 10-year Treasury yield the riskless rate because it's the rate that an institution can earn on its money without taking on virtually any risk. That's how reliable U.S. Treasuries are. They're considered riskless. And all other investments that these large institutions can make are weighed against the yield on the 10-year treasury. In general, more risk requires more return to be worthwhile. So as these institutions make riskier investments, they're going to demand more return. I'll give you two examples of what I mean. Here again, we have the 10-year treasury yield in blue and the average rate on a 30-year mortgage in red. The spread between the two is pretty consistent and averages 169 basis points, or 1.69%. Now, 30-year mortgages are another very safe investment. Today's home buyers are qualified against strict guidelines, and the loan is secured by real property, meaning that the lender can take the house if the homeowner doesn't make his mortgage payments. It's a safe investment, but not quite as safe as buying 10-year treasuries. So these financial institutions, on average, demand 169 basis points more return. A little more risk, translates into the need for a little more return. By contrast, much higher on the graph and in yellow, we have the average credit card interest rate. Now, credit card debt is much riskier than mortgage debt. Consumers have far lower qualifications to get a credit card and a much higher percentage of credit card users default on their debt. So credit card rates have an average spread of 1,000 basis points, or 10%, over the 10-year treasury yield. A lot more risk translates into the need for a lot more return. So the point here is that treasuries carry hardly any risk. They're safe. So whenever the economic outlook is bad, investors flock to the relative safety of treasuries. When it looks like a recession is in the near future, large financial institutions drop their riskier bets and buy up treasuries to keep at least some return coming through the door. And as we discussed, when demand for treasuries goes up, the price of treasuries gets bid up and the yield goes down. So a worsening economic outlook leads to lower treasury yields and hence lower mortgage rates with one huge caveat and that's the Fed rate. This graph shows us the 10-year Treasury yield in blue and the effective Fed rate in green since 1990. From this graph, we can learn a couple of important things. Firstly, the 10-year Treasury yield isn't as dynamic as the Fed rate, but hikes in the Fed rate tend to push up the Treasury yield and drops in the Fed rate tend to pull the Treasury yield down. Secondly, the 10-year Treasury yield usually, but not always, floats above the Fed rate. When the Treasury yield drops below the Fed rate, it's always after a period of rapid Fed rate increases and around the time that the increases are leveling off. We should note that we're in that moment right now. To understand why this is, we have to understand the Fed rate, by which I mean what it actually is, how it actually works. So if you've watched this far waiting for the great Fed rate explainer, here it is. Right after you hit that like and subscribe button, which are both easy, quick, and free, and extremely helpful. Okay, back to the explanation. Depository banks, which are banks that take deposits from customers, so think of Wells Fargo, Chase, Citibank, regional banks, local banks, all of them, are required to have 10% of those deposits on hand at the end of every business day. And they have to report to the Fed that they have 10% of their deposits, either physically in their own vaults or on account at the Fed at the end of every single business day. Now, banks make money by lending out those deposits and charging more interest then they pay the depositors. That's the whole banking game. So to maximize their profits, every bank is trying to have 90% of their deposits lent out at all times. They're trying to get as close to 10% in reserves as possible, and sometimes they lend out a little too much. 
So if a bank does their end of day accounting and discovers that they only have, say, 9.7% of deposits on hand, they are required to borrow enough money to reach 10% just overnight until they can rearrange some things the next business day and get back to 10% in reserves. This is the case with every depository bank at the end of every business day all across America. And for those banks that do need an overnight loan, they can borrow from banks that have more than 10% in reserve, and the rate that they must pay for the overnight loan is the Fed rate. That's right, the Fed rate is also called the overnight rate or the federal funds rate because it is the rate at which a bank can borrow money just for the night to reach 10% in reserves to be compliant with federal law until the following morning. And that's what the Fed rate is. If we return to our graph showing how the Fed rate and the 10-year Treasury yield interact, we see that hikes in the Fed rate are matched by increases in the Treasury yield. At some point, the Treasury yield ends up below the Fed rate, which is the situation we're in right now, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, let me explain why Fed rate hikes push up the Treasury yield. Two reasons. Firstly, a higher Fed rate means banks have to pay more interest on their overnight loans, so banks are more inclined to reach their 10% reserve requirement by the end of each business day. Treasuries, in addition to being very safe, are also very liquid on the secondary market, so it's easy to sell off a few treasuries rather than borrow the money overnight and pay that interest. When the Fed rate is a quarter percent, it's practically free money. But when the Fed rate is at 2% or 3%, banks will be much more likely to sell off some treasuries to avoid the overnight loan, which means less demand in the aggregate, which means lower treasury prices, which means higher treasury yields. So that's the first way a higher Fed rate produces higher treasury yields. Secondly, as the Fed rate goes up, it becomes another attractive, riskless investment for the banks. Remember, these overnight loans are between banks. The Fed just facilitates them and sets the interest rate. Making an overnight loan to another bank and earning a quarter of a percent isn't that attractive, but making the same very safe loan at two or three percent is attractive. So now treasuries aren't the only riskless investment with a decent return and demand drops off. Again, lower demand means lower prices, which means higher yields. But going back to our graph, we see that the upward pressure from the Fed rate eventually gives out. In every case of Fed rate hikes, the 10-year treasury begins falling before the Fed rate, falls faster, and drops below the Fed rate for some period of time. As I said, this is what's happening right now. So why? And where are rates going to go from here? In this graph, we bring it all together to see how the economy and the Fed rate work to push the 10-year treasury yield up and down. In red and yellow are economic indicators. The red columns show jobs lost or added per month, and the yellow area shows GDP growth or contraction. As you can see, GDP growth and job growth usually appear in tandem, and GDP contraction and job losses tend to happen at the same time too. And as per usual, we have the Fed rate in green and the 10-year Treasury yield in blue. And what we see is the same story repeating itself over and over. The economy runs hot, so the Fed starts raising the Fed rate to cool things down. This pushes the Treasury yield up, but as soon as economic indicators begin to falter, the Treasury yield drops fast, falling below the Fed rate. This happened in the late 90s, again in the 2004-2005 run-up, again in 2018-2019, and again in 2022. Let's zoom in on 2022. For most of the year, as the Fed rate rose, the Treasury yield rose with it. But the Treasury yield peaked in October as the 2023 recession became more certain, and in November, the Treasury yield dropped below the Fed rate. When the Fed made its last rate hike of the year on December 14th, it also revised its outlook for 2023 negatively. The Fed was projecting GDP to grow 1.2% in 2023, but revised that number down to 0.5%. And they were expecting unemployment to hit 4.4%, but they revised that number upward to 4.6%. With the economic outlook worsening, we can expect that 10-year Treasury yields will continue dropping despite a few more rate hikes. So what does this mean for mortgage rates in 2023? One more graph to answer that question. Here again, we have the 30-year mortgage rate in red floating above the 10-year treasury yield in blue. This float is called the spread. And in light blue, we can see how the spread has grown and shrunk since 1990. The average spread is 169 basis points. Currently, the spread is at 285 basis points, the highest it's been since the Great Recession. So we're going to see two things happen in the first half of 2023. Firstly, as the worsening economic picture comes into focus, the 10-year Treasury yield is going to continue dropping from its current 3.44% to 3% or even lower. Secondly, and again as the economic forecast comes into better focus, the spread between the 10-year Treasury yield and the 30-year mortgage rate 
is going to revert down from 285 basis points much closer to its mean of 169 basis points. With the Treasury yield a little over 3% and the spread a little south of 200 basis points, you got yourself a 5% interest rate in 2023. How will that impact the market? Subscribe for more.